Okay, I am recording and I'll watch here the um, participant window here and make sure that everyone gets in okay. Um, what I have before me here is an agenda and um, I did a quick agenda here and posted it on the registration page um, so that uh, if you guys want to look this over um, while I'm going through everything, um, you have kind of a reference of what we're going to talk about. And this will take a little while, so maybe more than an hour uh, before we get done with all of this. Um, we're going to cover, um, not go through every single option in the menu, a lot of it, you know, especially the core menu, which is um, the equivalent to the EIS main program. A lot of that is redundant, so, but I'm going to focus on the different things in there um, so that you guys get familiar with that. And we're going to cover um, transactions and how to create a transaction and the reports that are out there and um, some of the system menu. I'm not going to go everything, go through everything yet. Um, some of the things that we're still working on. Um, migration steps. Um, we're going to uh, discuss the beta districts, um, um, the pre and post. I'm going to go through those um, pretty thoroughly today so that you guys have a better understanding about what's involved. Uh, the import logs, um, also like possible errors in the import logs. Um, I'd also like to take you guys through the JIRA issues that are out there. Um, if you guys have never created, um, I know that you know we've had training before where you can set up dashboards in JIRA and then create filters so that you can watch a specific project like the inventory project. So I just want to take you through that in case you do want to just kind of keep an eye on things and where we're at. Um, the service desk has implemented a new component called inventory. So obviously you can start creating tickets and that component will be out there. And then we're gonna go through the documentation and just take you through what we have so far. So it is a work in progress. Um, we are beta right now, so we are in production. So there are some things that need to be ironed out. And I did list that as well down here. When we go through this training today and you're like, hmm, I wonder if they're gonna have um, like the admin log like of our import, um, is that gonna be out there? It will. So um, those things are gonna definitely be out there for you guys. Um, so this list down here provides um, some of those things that um, you may not be seeing today based on the instance that I have that you may be questioning. And so what I've done is I've just listed those along with the JIRA issue that it's tied to. And um, some of them are just questions too. And so we'll address some of this stuff at the end, but I at least wanted to give you the list so you guys may feel a little bit better about um, specific things. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. And I just want to uh, tell you guys a couple things up front. I've got people working here at my house um, on my kitchen. So if you hear a lot of banging or you hear my dog kind of barking because he's not sure what's going on, I'm just telling you guys now um, that uh, um, he may bark. So, all right, I got a question here. Um, yeah, I can uh, get that link for you, Stephanie. And let me just show you where that's at. It might be easier if you just go to it. Um, I'll go ahead and edit and close out of this so you can see. So in the um, SSDT um, meetings and training uh, website where we have our registration, um, what we have here, I'll go ahead and just click on this and post it in here for you. Oh, thank you. I already took care of it. Um, but in here, if you scroll down, to the inventory where you guys signed up, I added an agenda link. So, and that just has an agenda. So you should be set. Okay, I just wanna tell you guys, I am really excited about this. And I have to be honest, when I'm in here in the inventory system and I go back to USAS, I kind of go, oh, I wish USAS had this. I wish USAS had that. So, um, it's just very, I, I was telling um, some members of the team, it's very fluid. Like fluid is, is the word I think of when I think of inventory. 
it's just real easy to click on things and click off of things and it's just fast and it's um yeah it's just fluid it's smooth um so i'm pretty excited to show this stuff to you guys okay so we're going to go ahead and here's the home page now what to it uh so it's it's clean that's what i like about it and it's definitely has the district and the user up at the top and we are going to add the fiscal year two. Um, I think I had that on, the, on that list on the agenda. So that will be in here as well. And it will show the current year that they're in. Um, and so from there, core is the equivalent to your EIS mate um, section um, in classic. And so in here, most of this stuff, as you're looking through it, it's like, yeah, okay, I, I can see the EIS main menu in my head, and I can see you know, these options in here. And so um, what we're gonna do is we won't go through all of them because like I said, they get redundant. It's got the code, the description, and that's about it. Um, but I will um, pick on a few of these. And um, asset classes is your item category, or is your asset classes in uh, classic. Uh, class screen is what we call it. Um, the category codes are your item categories. And condition codes are your condition codes in classic. Configuration is that screen in, in EIS main. So we are gonna go into that one. Um, your disposition codes are your disposition screen. Um, fiscal years is something new. So that's kind of like your, your posting periods um, in USSR and then payroll. So we're, we'll go through that. Uh, the functions, funds, those are your function and fund uh, codes in uh, the EIS main, as well as location codes and organization codes. So like I said, we'll just hit upon a few of these here. And the first one I want to take you to is um, the configuration. So when I when you click on this, you will see, and I'll I'll go ahead and go into edit so you can see a little bit better. Um, what it's going to show here are the things that are pretty similar to what you're seeing in that screen. You got the IRN, you got the district, the last year closed. So that's what we had in classic as well. It showed the last year closed, not the current year. So when I'm looking at that, it says 2019. So that's telling me that I'm in fiscal year 2020 for these uh, files. Um, the foundation, um, tag number. So that is something a little di different. Um, we did have like a tag number as well, but um, in classic as well. And to be honest with you, I don't know how much your districts use the next available tag number. I know when I used to work um, with Nowaka districts, they all entered in the next tag because they had a physical tag number that they were looking at and they wanted to enter that tag number in when they were creating an item in EIS. Um, but we do have that capability out there. And so when they click on that, it is going to bring out a prefix. So this looks is, is, is kind of similar to the rep prefix in USSR. Uh, where they can go in and put in a prefix number and then it will auto assign. Um, so by default, it's turned off. Um, we have uh, the gap flag, obviously. If their gap flag is set to yes in Classic, when they migrate over, um, that will be checked automatically. Same as the function codes and the received. Um, those are also options in that screen. Um, so if those are, are marked, then they're going to be marked in here as well. This information will get carried over. Um, I'm going to ignore this stuff down here for now. Um, this is something that the users won't see and it might change between now and production, um, but it's basically the connection between USSR and inventory and basically because of your pending file so that you can pull items from USSR into your pending file. So that might change. So I'm really not going to go into too much detail there because I just don't want to confuse you if it's not going to be in here. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and save this. So again, this is very similar to what you know you guys were seeing in that screen in Classic. Now, the other part of this, you're probably like, where's the cap threshold stuff? Because that was in that screen in Classic. 
that's going to be under fiscal year. So it's kind of divided up in between your configuration screen and your fiscal years. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on fiscal years. <clears throat> and so in classic, I'm in fiscal year 2020. And in my DAT screen, which my test files are a little wonky. So you may see some stuff in here, like the life limit's 25. Yeah, that's really, really not a reality. <laughs> People don't have a life limit of 25. Um, so just kind of ignore that. Um, but it's going to show if I was in fiscal year 2020 in classic, it's going to bring me over in fiscal year 2020 in redesign. So you'll see this is, looks very similar to posting periods. And so we don't have month periods in inventory, we have year periods. And so here's the fiscal year I'm in and it just shows me you know, what my fiscal year entails from July to June. Um, and then it includes my dollar limit and my life limit. And so um, that stuff's getting pulled from that screen. So that's gonna get pulled over. And then I also have my open and my current periods, which you guys are familiar with um, because of USAS and payroll. And so a lot of the same icons over here that allow you to go in. Um, now, can you go in and change the life limit and the dollar limit? No, you couldn't do that in uh, classic either. Um, we have, an underneath system, a capitalization criteria that allows you, that's the equivalent of EIS cap, that will allow you to go in and uh, change your uh, dollar and life limits. Um, when you're ready to create a new year, you do it like you would normally in redesign um, and you have some payroll, you would go in and, and create that fiscal year. When you close a fiscal year, it's like EIS close, similar to it in classic. And so it will close the year, add another year's worth of depreciation onto those items that are being tracked um, and set the, the beginning balances for the new year. So those things are happening behind the scene. It's just nice because you don't see all that happening. Um, so that's basically, I just kind of want to explain that screen in redesign. And like I said, it consists of configuration and the fiscal years. So any questions about that? I'm just kind of watching chat too to make sure. And that is all explained to you in our documentation. You've been hitting it hard, trying to get everything out there. There are some, you know, definitely some draft chapters out there still, but it does explain all of this in there as well. So the rest of the information in here is the rest of the EIS mate. So I'll just touch upon one of these that may look a little bit different. I'll pick on category codes. So when I go into category codes, you notice everything is, is in a wonderful grid format. And I love the grids in this new version of Vaden that we're working in it that's working in inventory. Like I said, it's very fluid. Um, and so in here, you're going to see um, what's currently displayed out here. And um, we basically took those fields from cat screen and placed them in here. So like I said, all of this will get migrated over, imported over, over. This stuff gets extracted out of EIS and gets imported in. So all of their category codes from classic are in here. And so when you kind of look here, um, so here are the codes. Um, their description, if you are tracking useful life in here, those would, will get carried over. Any inflation rate, if those are being used. Insurance classes, if those are being tracked. And your asset classes, so if they're entering those in there as well. And so if I just go ahead and just click on one of these to view it, um, you'll see what it looks like here. And so if I need to go in and make a change, um, then these are the things that I can change. Anything that's got a dark gray, anything that's light gray, sh you know, shade, obviously I can't access. So just like you couldn't in classic, you couldn't go in and change the actual code. Um, so those type of fields are restricted. And I just cancel and close out of here. So very quick um, and clean the way that that's handled. Um, and then if I wanted to just go right into edit, I use my edit key 
and then delete. So obviously there is security behind this. So if I have items that are tied to this uh, category, I can't just go in and delete this category because that leaves that item out there without a category anymore. And so we've got things like that monitored as well. I'll just look at one more of these, pick on location codes. So in here, and this is a good example, I'm glad I clicked on this one. Um, right now we have the location codes by default, the sort is number description category. So I'm gonna play around with the filter row when we get into items. So I know I haven't touched upon that much, but I just wanna show you how you can go in and move your columns around. So right now I've got number and I've got category. Well, category I wanna put before number. So this is my category um, of the location. And then this is my room number of the location, just like we had in classic. So those get carried over and then the description. So now when I go back in, my sorting here will, will stay. So it's not like I have to go in and move that category column over again. So just like it does in classic, so, or in redesign and use s and payroll. So same thing here. Um, so you can go in and make any type of you know, changes of your sequencing of your columns. You can go in and uh, use um, the sort feature here for ascending, descending. And then, like I said, you can go in and I'll play around this more in items, but I can go in and select um, or enter a specific filter and it will just filter from that. And it's just very quick and uh, very simple on how it does that. And one other thing too, is this export grid items. So this will allow me to go in and export whatever I filtered on. So if I wanted a report of this or spreadsheet, um, I can click on export grid items and I'll get two different options. I'll get a CSV and an Excel. So those are our two types talking to um, the focus group. Um, they all felt like, you know, it's a spreadsheet type of thing that's obviously needed when it comes to exporting. So we made sure we had those two types in. And then I just click on export and it creates it. So it's gonna go out there and just include the EL, um, any locations that have the EL category and create a spreadsheet for me. Okay. We do have a more column, but uh, we don't have it in a lot of the core menus because we didn't need it. Because if you just kind of look back and you know, think about EIS main, um, there aren't that many fields. So we just basically have all of them included on the grid. Um, so it, you will see um, the more column when we get into transactions and we go into items especially, because when you think about item screen and classic, there are a lot of fields in there. So you will be able to narrow that down to what you want to see on the grid. Okay, any questions about core before we move on to transactions? That one's pretty straightforward. Okay. So in the transaction menu, what I'm doing is I'm just hovering over this. Um, so, and then when I want to go to a particular item, I hover over it, you notice that it underlines it. And at that point I can click on it to get the, to that specific option. Um, so again, very clean in how that's handled. Um, so with the transaction menu, this is EIS screen. So you've got you know, item screen, acquisition screen, transfer transaction screen, disposition screen, and the classic programs, they all fall under here now. And so um, a lot of this stuff, um, you know, you've got the same capabilities that you, know, you had in classic. And so we'll go ahead and we'll cover items first. I'm gonna pick on the, the biggest one here first. Okay. And so looking at this, um, you'll see I have a lot of stuff on here and that's okay. And I can add and remove things in here. And you will see things that may not be working quite right and that's okay because we're aware of some of that and already have your issues for it. Um, so um, if you have any questions, obviously when we're going through this, let me know. I love the item grid. 
and I think about item screen, and I don't know how many times I've said, in the three screens of item screen, I don't have to say that anymore. Everything's on one screen. Um, and then you've got, you know, all of your items here that you can just filter. You couldn't do that in classic. You had to run a report um, to get what you wanted, and you'll find yourself using the grid more instead of reports. And your users will be doing that more than reports to get what they want. Um, and so just talking about um, the filter row here. And so we are working on adding extra filters. Right now, obviously, I can go in and this is a new field, which I love, um, where you can filter by capitalized or non-capitalized. So if I enter in the word true, obviously, it's just going to bring up any items that are capitalized and display those on the grid. Um, and we're working on trying to shortcut some of those too, um, you know, T for true, F for false, stuff like that. And so, um, so you can enter in what you want to filter. If there's a specific number that you want, you can go ahead and enter that in. Or if I wanted to go in and say, I want to see everything that uh, starts with the four, I can use my wild cards and it's going to go out there. Maybe I just need the one. Put that again. Let me pick on. There we go. Now it's starting to filter. <laughs> so you see, as I'm going in here, it's going in and trying to search for those things that have one five in them. And so you'll notice then my wild cards will is kind of like an asterisk or you know it's my equivalent of a wild card is the percent sign. Um, so I can go ahead and, and do that in here as well. We don't have greater than or less than yet, but that's going to be in, I think that's going to be in here before production. So we are adding um, more filters. So I know you know that your users are going to be using greater than, less than, you know, this is kind of like a range, this percent that I'm doing here, kind of. Um, so, so, you know, we are going to be adding more things on. So if you guys, you know, once we get that out there in production and you want to see other things as well, you know, obviously create tickets and um, we'll see what we can do to, to get some of those added. Um, I talked about um, the export already. We'll get to depreciate in a little bit and create. I do want to talk about the more column that you're seeing over here. This is our more column and in inventory. And so when I click on this, let's move some things around here. And when I click on this here, it's pretty cool because what you're going to see is all of the different items that are already selected. Now, um, we do have a couple things that uh, we're working on when it comes to, um, we noticed a couple like hiccups in here about you know, something being selected, but it's not showing us selected on the grid. So we're aware of that and we're working on that. Um, but what I love about this is that if there are things in here that I don't want to appear anymore, such as my acquisition date, maybe I wanna get rid of that. I can just click off of it and it disappears right away. So, and you says it kind of has to spin a little bit. Um, so I can go in and turn things on and off just like that. And it will add them and remove them instantly. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, you know, there are a couple things in here too that um, if you feel, you know, some, we did talk to the focus group about everything in classic in the item screen and how it should be showing in redesign or if it should be showing in redesign. And there were a few things that, um, you know, felt that weren't being used. Um, and so one of the things um, that is not going to get migrated over is the maintenance section in item screen. Um, I've never had anyone ever use that in all the years I've been working with EIS. The focus group said they don't use it. They're, you know, uh, our, our hardware people, um, their tech coordinators have that stuff on a spreadsheet. They keep track of things that way instead of tracking them in EIS. And so, um, and that is noted 
on our pre-import steps that that information, the maintenance section of item screen will not get imported over. So you will not see that area in here either. Um, and when you're creating an item, obviously you're not gonna see that area. So there are a few things that, and then we kind of prioritize, you know, the importance of the fields that are in there. And so if there are things in here where your districts are like, yeah, they constantly use this field. This needs to be added to the more column and it's not there right now, let us know. Um, so, but you'll notice here when I scroll down, these are all the ones that are sitting out there. And like I said, um, you know, some of these, um, if I wanna go in and just add them, I click on it. And then if I wanna remove it, I click on it again. So very simple. Okay. Um, any questions before I get started on adding an item? All right, I'll go ahead and click on create. Okay, and so when I click on create, you have to remember when you're in item screen and you go to F12 to add an item, it takes you to the acquisition window first, allowing you to go in and enter your acquisition information. That's what this is. I call it our acquisition window in here as well. And you'll know right away you're in it because I see right here that it says continue item. So that's telling me I need to put my acquisition information in here. And once I click on continue to item, it takes me to my item window, not three screens, just one um, with all the information I can fill in. So a lot of that, whatever I enter in here, will be migrate or will um, be included and auto-populated in the item screen. And so the first thing you're going to see is the pending item. So obviously this is going to go to my pending item and it's going to display the PO number, the item number, and the invoice number. So all of that's right here for us, which is so much nicer than what we had in EIS. And so I can go ahead and click on the, the PO that I want to pull in. So I'm just going to pick on one here. And you'll notice that it displays all the information about that. And so here is where I put in my tag number. And like I said, a lot of districts are used to manually putting in tag numbers because they've got the tag sitting there in front of them. But remember when I showed you that configuration screen, they can auto populate the tag number too. So I'm going to go ahead and just enter one in. Let's see here. I don't know a tag number that I don't already have on file, so we're just going to shoot for that one. Um, and you'll see here that it automatically populates with acquisition by default. Still has the two options, acquisition and payment, and then the date. Um, so this is a date that's um, pulled in. Now this could be the invoice date or this could be the um, receive date. So it depends on what you have set there in your configuration as to what's going to get pulled in here. Um, the account code, the vendor and the vendor name that pulled in, um, the amount, so that's the amount of the item, uh, the purchase order information, and then anything else that you want to add in here. Obviously, this information is going to be blank because we haven't created the item to add the fund function and asset class yet. So if we go in and look at this acquisition, after we create the item, this information will be filled in. So I basically have everything that I need at this point. So I'm going to go ahead and click on continue to item. Hopefully I don't get an error about the tag. Good. Um, and so in here then is my item screen window, my three screens of item screen all in one. And so I can go in and add any extra information in here. And so in here, if I want to, uh, um, excuse me, a category code, I can go ahead and pull that one in. And again, because this is anonymized data, everything kind of looks a little weird um, on these uh, codes and stuff. And the number of items that got pulled in from the purchase order. Uh, my fund function and asset class, I'll click on general fund, construction, 
and fixtures, furniture, equipment. If I have an organization code that I want to use, I can go ahead and put that in here. Um, a condition code, if your districts use that, that will be in here. My location, so I can go in ahead and put that in here as well. Um, the status gets pulled over, obviously, to active. And um, the replacement cost and insurable values get populated just like they did in Classic with the same amount that's on the acquisition. And my acquisition information, I'll scroll down to that. So that was pre-populated as well. My acquisition date that got pulled in, um, in here. Um, it's going to default to purchased as my acquisition method. That can be changed. And these are the other ones that were available in Classic as well. Here's my original cost. Again, that's matching my replacement and insurance values. And then I have my depreciation information. So in here, um, do I want to track depreciation on this? Um, if so, I'm going to go ahead and select straight line. And then my beginning date auto populates. It didn't do that in classic. So that's nice. It pulls the acquisition date as the beginning date. And you'll see a slight difference in redesign. We include month day here instead of just month year. Um, life expectancy, that got pulled in because of my item category that I entered in. So my item category um, is being tracked. I have got the uh, life expectancy on that. So when I went in and entered this item category, it auto-populated the life expectancy. Classic worked that way as well. Um, salvage value, life today, obviously this won't get populated until after you close for the year. Um, and then you've got lease information and user-defined information as well. So this information, whatever is in Classic right now for a tag, will get migrated over in here. So all of that should appear in here. Um, and so if everything looks good, I can go ahead and click Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we do have a question in the chat. Tony asked if you can tab in this screen or if you have to point and click on everything. You can tab, Tony. Yeah, sorry. Yes, so you can go in and just tab and go through it. So definitely. I'm gonna go ahead and save it. <clears throat> And so, you know, one thing that we thought would be a good idea is to leave it on the screen. You know, you go ahead and save this. And if you want to look it over before you're actually ready to get out of it, instead of just it, the window disappearing on you, we felt that it was a good idea to leave it on the screen here. If there's something in here where you're like, oh, shoot, I selected the wrong you know, category code, I can go back in and edit and uh, change that. So. Um, so everything's here, if everything looks good, I can go ahead and close out of here. And I also will need to close out of the acquisition window as well. So there is a little bit of a two-step process here. So I'm gonna go ahead and close out of that too. And if I wanted to look up that tag, I can go ahead and enter it in get rid of this. I don't think that was a capitalized asset. Um, and so here it is. And again, if I needed to go back in and edit it, I can um, or view it, things like that. So if I wanted to go in and look at the acquisition that's tied to this, I could go up to transactions, acquisition, enter in the same tag number, and it will appear in there as well. So any questions about creating a tag is so much nicer. <laughs> Very clean. Okay. Well, I am going to select a different tag number to show you something as well. We do have a split uh, feature in here. And so I'm going to pick on one of these. And looking at this particular tag, it has a number of items of five. So I want to split this out into five individual tags. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and view it. You can't see the split feature until you're actually viewing uh, the tag. 
And so here is the split capability here. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on split. And uh, very simple window that it has in here right now. And, you know, we are still like, splits are kind of a work in progress. So we do appreciate feedback on this. Um, but currently how it's working is that obviously it's going to display the original tag that you can't change. That's the one you selected that you want to split. And it does have a starting tag number, which it does default to that original tag. Now, one thing right now with splits is that at this point, if I want to split this out into five different tags and I want to start with this tag number, the next five available tags, so if I 22 or 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25, those tags cannot already exist on the system. But if I try this and I do a projection and one of those tags already exists, it's going to give me an error. And so at this point, you have to ensure that your starting tag number and the subsequent tags are available to use. And so in my situation, I don't believe, I believe that 22, 23, 24, they're already been used. So I'm gonna change my starting tag number. Let me get that one here. So, and then, so I know that 30, 31, 32, 33, and 34 are available for me to use. So I have, I don't have them on the system right now. And so I put in that beginning number and I do uh, enter in the split, which the number of items was five. And what I can do is I can validate this first. And by default, it does a projection, which is nice too. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and validate. And I didn't get an error saying I can't use any of these tags. So that's good. So at this point, it's saying you're ready to just do a projection. So I'm going to go ahead and click on split. And this is one of those things I was telling you that is happening right now with my test data. So um, you, you won't have to worry about that. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. And just to take a look at what you're seeing here. So what you're going to see is you're going to see um, this, the original tag. And then you're going to see the tags that it is going to split into. We know that because it says projection up here. And so it's taking the serial and model numbers and pulling them in here. Now, if that's something that um, your districts don't want, I, I know that, I think we discussed that, that might already be a JIRA issue um, where it's not gonna pull that over. Jason, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we've got one already out there that it's, or maybe we're waiting on feedback, um, but right now it's pulling in the serial and model number from the original tag into here, as well as the organization and the location codes. I believe in classic, it definitely pulls these over, but I'm not sure about serial and model number. I don't think it does. Um, so, you know, uh, if that's something where your districts are like, I want to be able to put that stuff in myself, um, don't carry those over into my splits, then we can correct that. Um, but currently, this is how it works. And so, very nice and clean. You can see exactly what's going on here. So, if I go back, I'm just going to hit my back button here. Hey, Michelle. Yes. I think in classic, I think it did. I think it did pull in this um, serial number and the model number and the model number. I think it should for sure, because that if you're splitting an item, it's usually all the same model number. Right. The serial numbers and a lot of times are very similar too. So it's kind of nice that most of the digits are there and you're just updating a few. So my input is yes, keep that data. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, usually that makes sense, the model number. That doesn't change because it's the same thing, like a bunch of laptops or something that you're getting. That serial number, yeah, you're right, just may be a couple digits off, so. And so now if I go in and uh, I'm gonna go back and, and call up that same one again and do an actual, it will, it's just that my, my uh, files are, are, like I said, are a little off, so. Um, and I got that screen that had to take me back here, you will go back to the screen 
where you can just click off of projection and do an actual. So you don't have to go and find the tag number again. So I apologize for that. Um, so let me go back in. So once you know, you look at your projection report, you'll be back at this screen. You won't have to find the tag again. And so I'm gonna go ahead and enter that in again. And this time, I'm gonna do the validate. And again, I didn't get any errors, so those tags are open. And I'm gonna go ahead and do an actual split. This time I didn't get that message, so. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and do a PDF here and take a look at it. And again, I don't see a projection this time. So obviously it's an actual uh, run. And so here are my new numbers. And if I go back and I close out of here and I close out of this tag. So this was 019321. This tag should no longer be on file. So I'm gonna go ahead and just <clears throat> do a search on this again. you'll see it's no longer on file because it's been split into these different tags. Thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four. 31, 32, And so, and if this was a tag, and I can't remember, if this was a tag that was capitalized and uh, now I split it out amongst five different tags and they're all under the capitalization threshold, these tags will not be capitalized. And you'll see right here, you can tell because they all say false. So it will go out there and uh, make those you know, updates and stuff. Um, so that one item is no longer um, on file. And obviously um, the five items that replaced that that were split out, they're all um, uh, non-capitalized assets. Any questions about splits? Okay, um, I'm gonna pick on depreciation now. Um, in Classic, we had an EIS DEPR program that allowed uh, districts to go in and recalculate their depreciation. And um, it was a program that we've always strongly cautioned, you know, that they use because it does change the life to date, it recalculates it. Um, and the reason being that we're cautious about it is because it does kind of um, change the true tracking of your depreciation, um, especially if you've gone in and updated an item and added another acquisition and increased the original cost value. Um, obviously, if you're tracking that item for depreciation, <clears throat> it's changing your depreciation amount based off the new value. And so for four years, you could have an item that's been depreciated $125 a year. And then <clears throat> you decide that, oh, I've got an additional acquisition I want to add to that item and increase the value of the original cost. And now the depreciation is $225 a year. So that history, you know, is showing for the first four years, I had 125 and now it's 225. Well, um, if I decided um, in year five that I'm going to go in and recalculate the depreciation on this item, it doesn't care about the 125 I had for the first four years and the 225 I'm having for the next four. It's going to look at the current original cost. So if it was 1,000 and I change it to 1,500 after year four, and I've got that divided by eight years, um, it's going to give me, it's going to basically track the depreciation based off of the current value and the life um, and the life useful life of that item. So um, we just kind of want to tell people that, you know, it, it will, you know, recalculate depreciation if it needs to. Um, usually districts don't mess with depreciation. 
unless their auditors have asked them to change it because the depreciation is wrong on an item, um, or if they um, have a new inventory. They're doing a completely new inventory and the depreciation values from the appraisal company were wrong or they need to go in, they didn't include them and they need to rebuild the depreciation, then they can use depreciate or they used EISDPR to do that. Um, I know personally, just with experience, districts would call and say, you know, my auditors were here and tags number one, two, and three are off. Um, they want me to go in and recalculate the depreciation on those. And so in classic, they'd have to run the EIS DPR program in projection to get those values. Because in classic, EIS DPR did not allow them to calculate uh, for just a, one particular item. It was all or nothing. So that's why we always told them to run it in projection mode to get that value. And then you can go into the item, the item screen and modify it to whatever the projection report has. And here you can select a particular item and to depreciate and recalculate depreciation on that. So if the auditor says, I need to go in and change, you know, this tag and this tag, I can click on those, you know, select those and, uh, and click on depreciate and go in and let it recalculate my depreciation. So that's kind of a, a nice advantage compared to what we had in classic. So I'm going to pick on one of these and kind of take you through Oh, I thought I had this one more. Can I try this? Here it is. Forgot the zero. And so my original cost here is $45.97.25. I'm going to go ahead and just pull this one up. And I go down to the depreciation information. I've been tracking depreci depreciation on it since. Um, the 2018 is when I started. I'm in 2020 in these files. So I definitely have this, you know, beginning date obviously is in fiscal year 19. So I should have one complete year or almost complete year that started in September. So that's very good to note. Um, almost one complete year, 10 months worth of depreciation that needs to be tracked on this. And right now my life today, the auditors are saying that's wrong, it should be less. Um, so they want me to go in and calculate, uh, recalculate the depreciation on this. So I'm going to go ahead and close out of this. And I'm going to go ahead and click on depreciate. And what's nice about this is it gives you a projection, just like the classic program did. And it's just going to depreciate uh, run that uh, projection uh, just on this particular item. So I'm going to go ahead and click on generate and see what I get. And so um, here is my current value and here is my value after. Now if I would go out there and take that original cost, divide it by, I think it was seven years for useful life, divide it by seven years to get my yearly depreciation divide that by 12 months to get my monthly depreciation times 10 months, because this started in September. So September, I use my fingers, September, October, November, keep going until next June, that's 10 months. Take that monthly depreciation times 10 months equals my after figure. It might be off a cent or two based on rounding, um, but that's my, my figure. So if you know, the auditors say, yes, that's the figure it should be, um, then they can go in and just run that depreciation on that particular item. So obviously you can select more than one item here, obviously. If you know, the auditors are saying there are five items that the depreciation needs to be recalculated, 
um, here's the amounts that it should be. Um, you can go ahead and select those specific items and click on depreciate and it will just depreciate those five. So it'll recalculate depreciation for those five. So in the documentation, we do have it noted that, you know, this is something that's not common. They don't just go in and run depreciate whenever. Um, it was always something in classic where it was requested by an auditor or like I said, in an inventory. So in here, it should be treated the same way. And so we have it documented that way too. Um, so they do need to be careful when they're going in here and doing this. Okay, any questions about either creating an item or splitting or depreciating an item? Okay. And that's really all there is with items. I mean, it's just, it's so easy. So you're going in here, you can see the whole screen with all the information in here. If I needed to go in and edit something in here, obviously it has the same restrictions that it had in classic. If I go in and try to edit this item here, um, there are certain things that I can't change just like you could in classic. So I can't go in and change the fund, the function, or the asset class in here. Um, I have to do a transfer transaction to change those. Um, I can't go in and just edit the original cost. I have to go in and do an acquisition to change that, just like you had to in Classic. One thing I do wanna make note of in here I didn't talk about before is we decided, this is a little different, we decided to include the beginning balance amount just as an FYI in here. Um, just to show that, you know, if this item obviously was capitalized um, and it has a check mark showing that it is, um, and obviously I'm in a new year, so that, that uh, was set, that beginning balance for this, oh, this was added in 19, we're in fiscal year 20 now. So when I close for the year, that beginning balance figure got set behind the scenes um, and we include it in here um, just as an FYI. The districts aren't used to seeing a beginning balance field. Um, that was always behind the scenes. And the only time you could really see it is through data tree when you went in and, and looked at the item screen uh, record. Um, so um, if that's something that is, leads to a lot of questions that um, you, know, you guys are like, no, I don't know why we have it in here, we don't really need it. It's probably more for your benefit than it is for them. Um, but we felt like you know, it's something that uh, we felt was important at this point. And, you know, we'll wait on feedback to see if, you know, you guys want to keep it in there or not. But I did want to explain that one because that isn't something that you see in classic. So on the item screen. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close out of this. Um, I am going to just go in and just create another item just to show you how to back out of one. Or you're in the middle of creating the item and you need to back out to get back to the acquisition portion to make changes. So if I go back into create and I pull from the pending file and I go ahead and go on to continue to item. And then I'm in here and I realize uh, the acquisition amount is wrong. Um, it should be something different. I need to go back in to the acquisition portion of that screen to change it. So what I can do is I can cancel out of this. And then it takes me back to the acquisition. I can go ahead and edit and change my amount. And then I can go right back into continue item to continue adding that item and everything to get updated. Yep, 750, 750. Now, if I'm in the middle of this and I realize I am on the wrong tag, I don't even wanna be in here. I just wanna close out without saving any changes. You can just do that, close, close. No harm, no foul, nothing's done. You just close right out of that. It didn't create the acquisition, didn't create the item. So nothing got updated and you're back to square one. Okay, and we do have that all documented as well, how to back out of an item or how to get back to the acquisition. 
um, in order to make any changes to it before you post the item. Okay, well, I'm gonna move on to adding additional acquisitions to existing tags. So obviously we were creating a tag and while we were creating the tag, it was creating the acquisition at the same time. But now we have an item on file and we got an upgrade to it. And so I wanna add, I can't go in to items and edit the existing item and change the original cost. It's not gonna let me, it didn't classic either. Um, and so I need to go in and go to acquisitions. And I think I have one listed here. And I'm gonna look at, and so obviously if I look at this existing tag, This was the original one created um, back in August of 19. And so if I just look at the acquisition screen here, so this is acquisition transaction equivalent in classic. Um, obviously, you know, here's my tag number. Here is the original one that was created when I created the tag. Um, you'll see that the fund function and asset class are populated and it's gonna show uh, which ones based on when I created that tag. Um, my update original cost field obviously is checked because it did, you know, update the original cost when that original tag uh, was created. And so what I want to do is I want to increase the value by adding another acquisition to this existing tag. So I'm going to click on create. And I'm going to go ahead and pull in the PO that I want to increase the value. That's not a good one. I don't even know what I have here in this there. That looks good. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and enter in that existing tag number, 091601. And it defaults to an acquisition type, it's pulling in all the information from the purchase order. And I do wanna update the original cost. So I wanna make sure that that's checked. And you'll notice too, it does pull in because it, the tag's already on file the fund function and asset class of that tag. Um, obviously I can't change that stuff in here, couldn't in classic either. Um, and then from here, I can go ahead and click on create. Now, if this was something that should have been done in the prior year, maybe I forgot to add this update last year, I can click on error correction. And um, if it is a capitalized asset, that amount, because I clicked on error correction is not going to go in the acquisition column on the change schedules. It's going to go in the adjustments column on those change schedules. So that's what that error correction does. We have the same option in classic as well. So basically, you know, everything's already filled in for me, which is wonderful. If I needed to make changes, I could. And I'm just gonna go ahead and click on create. And you'll notice now I've got two acquisitions now against that. And the amount, if I told them them up, should be something like close to 1300, I think here. So I'm gonna go check that item out underneath items. So I'm gonna close out of here. Oops. And there we go. There's my original cost. So it did update that. So now I have two acquisitions against that one tag. And that's basically how you create an additional acquisition on an existing item. Going through the rest of the menu here, we have hit acquisitions and items. I'm going to pick on dispositions. So again, you've got an amazing grid with all of the things that you've disposed of already. So in classic, you could only see a handful of them at a time. And I think dispositions, maybe one or two, I don't remember. I might be getting that mixed up with transfer transactions. Um, so again, here are all the um, uh, uh, field or columns, sorry, <laughs> that I have. And I can go in and change this around by adding and removing stuff and resequencing it too, if I wanted to. So, you know, that's one thing again, just like you guys did with USAS and payroll, tell your you know, users to customize these and make them their own. So what makes sense to them? Um, so in here, obviously, if I wanted to create a disposition, you know, that 
tag isn't going to be on here yet because these are um, tags that already have been disposed of. So I'm going to click on create. And let's see here. I'm going to pick on a tag I already have. And once I enter that tag in and I hit tab, it pulled in everything regarding that tag. Um, it does use today's um, date, um, but I'm just, it does that in classic two, um, but I'm in fiscal year 20. So I wanna make sure that I change that up. So I'm just going to, and again, it does bring up this really neat uh, calendar too. And I can just hit enter to select it. Um, and then if I have an amount that I received for this item, I could put that in here. That's just an FYI amount like it was in Classic. I'm gonna select my, um, um, my disposition code. Um, those come from Corp underneath dispositions. Um, who authorized it? And it pulls in the original cost and the cost disposed of um, the items, number of items, it was just one. And so if this was a disposition that was supposed to be disposed of in a prior year, I can click on error adjustment again. Um, and it's really, I think, a bigger issue when this is a capitalized asset, because if obviously it's 134.92. So me going in and making an error adjustment, it's not gonna show in the team schedules because this isn't a capitalized asset. If this was a capitalized asset I'm disposing of and it was you know, supposed to be um, disposed of this year, it's gonna show in the dispositions column on the uh, 103 and the 104 reports. But if it is something that should have been disposed of in the prior year, I have to make sure that I check mark this error adjustment flag. And then what happens is it shows up on the adjustments column of those change schedule reports. I'm gonna go ahead and click on create. And again, it gives me a chance to make sure everything looks good. If it does, I go ahead and close out. And here's the tag that I just disposed of. If I disposed of the wrong one, okay, I can delete it. I can delete dispositions for the year that I created the disposition. Um, I can go in and edit if I need to because I forgot. Maybe my method was wrong. I can go in and edit it and change my disposition method. Um, so you, so um, obviously any items that you disposed of in prior years, um, you won't be able, I don't believe you're able to delete. Um, if I go in click on this again, you'll notice all my prior year ones, the delete column is grayed out, or the delete icon, I'm sorry, is grayed out. So it's just items in the current year that I disposed, I could um, delete um, that disposition. What happens then is the item, once I create the disposition, if I go look up the item, it's going to say disposed of. If I delete the disposition, it's going to delete the disposition off of the system. I go back into items and it's going to be set back to its original status if it was active. Any questions about dispositions? All right. Um, I'm going to move on to transfers. And transfers is the equivalent of the transfer transaction in um, the EIS screen program in Classic. And so these are all of the transfers that have currently been done. So again, any dispositions, any transfers, any acquisitions that they had in Classic will all migrate over. Um, so those should be pulled in here. Um, and obviously, if I want to create a new one, I'm going to click on Create. And I'm going to go ahead and I can go in and start filtering on that tag number, which is kind of cool. Um, so let me go in. And 
And this is the one I want to create a transfer transaction on. Like I said, this is anonymized data, so you've got kind of some weird descriptions, but it is the uh, tag and the description of the tag. And then it shows me the amount. Um, and so what happened is the uh, function code was wrong on this. And so I'm going to change again my date to 2020. And when I go ahead and click on type, I have three different things I can change. The fund, the function, or the asset class, just like you did in Classic. My function, when I pull that, pulls up the existing function code on that tag, which is 1100. That is wrong. It should have been 2750. So I just scroll down to find 2750. And again, if this is something that should have been um, transferred in a prior year, I click on error adjustment. Um, but if not, it's this year, I just leave that go and I click on create. And again, I can review the information, make sure everything looks good and close out of it. And it is now here. And obviously if I did something wrong and I just wanna start all over, I can delete it because I can delete transfers that were created in the current year that I'm in. Or if it's a prior year one, obviously it won't let me. So I think you're able to see that, see how it's grayed out. So this one was done in this current fiscal year. So that's why it's active. I could delete it if I need to. Okay. You guys are a quiet group. You're just kind of absorbing everything, right? I tell you what, we're going to do pending items and then we're going to take a little bit of a break a little stretching break uh, because you know as i had stated um in the registration page this is going to go longer than an hour so we'll give ourselves a, a chance to stretch and stuff and then we'll start on reports and stuff but before we do that i do want to talk about pending items and so um, one thing, and we do have it marked in the documentation, and I believe we may have announced or said something earlier too about it, is that the pending file from Classic does not get migrated over. So um, that's one thing to be aware of uh, when your districts are migrating. Um, for those districts that are already on redesign, um, it'll just be a matter of going in and pulling the information from use SR into here to recreate your pending file. Um, and that's what this pull from use option does. So when I click on this, <clears throat> it asks me for a starting date, PO date. Um, and when I put that in here, I get a confirmation uh, or I click on confirmation and it goes out there and pulls those items in. Um, we are adding a feature on here um, to pull rejected files. And let me explain why. Um, and this is just me coming across something thinking, hmm, this might be something we need to do. If I went in here and I um, went in and pulled like from a, a wrong date, I, put in, I pulled in way too much stuff than what I needed to and I basically wanted to start over. Um, what happens is if I go in and we are gonna include a top box here to select all, if I go in and select all of these and then delete them to reject them, it sends a status back to us saying that that item has been rejected. Um, and so that works out well if they're cleaning their pending file up and they will have. If I take on the day then I really include that. I go in and reject all of that. <clears throat> okay. I go in and reject all of that. What happen is it's going to mark it as rejected in USAS and I can't pull it back in. So what we're going to do is that says include rejected items based on whatever date you are in here. Those will get pulled back in. 
So we didn't want, you know, a mistake of pulling something in to be costly. So we wanted to make sure that, you know, it will pull those back in in case you mistakenly, you know, rejected them. We want to pull them back in. So um, that will be available. It'll all be documented once we get that up to date. It should be on the production version, I believe. Um, but I just wanted to let you guys know about that. Um, but, you know, obviously when you do pull from USAS, you start looking at some of this and you're like, yeah, I'm never going to take that. I'm not going to take that either. Um, you can go ahead and click on, you know, the one or hit the, uh, select them all and click on delete or, you know, go to those specific ones and delete them. Like I said, it sends a message back to you, SASR, saying it's been rejected. And it's looking at those items in USASR that are marked for inventory. So part of the USASR post import process is to set up your inventory configuration. So you're setting up, you know, to use it and you're setting up your threshold amounts. And so for your districts that are on USASR, that's already been something that should have been taken care of. And so while they're going in, in processing invoices in USASR, and it meets that threshold they set up, it's going to mark it for inventory. And so when you pull from USAS, it's pulling from those marked invoiced items. It's gonna pull those in based on whatever date you put in here. And then from here, like I said, you go in, clean up anything you need to, to get your pending file to what it was. Um, if you kind of want to, um, one of our pre-data extract steps is to run a 501 in the and look at what your pen file. So thing to compare back to. And then you're going to go in here as part of your post import steps and run the pending file and check it back to classic and see what needs to be cleaned up. Any questions about that? So in pending, you can't edit existing items on the pending file. You can't add specific items to the pending file, um, but you can delete. And that's how it behaved in classic. Um, so at, the, at this point, that's how it's going to be working in Amazon. Okay. And so, like I said, anything that's sitting in here, when you go into either acquisitions and pull from the pending file or items, it's looking at what's in here. Okay. I'll tell you what, like I said, it's a quarter after 10 now. So let's take a break here. Um, let's take about a five minute break, which lets you guys stretch and stuff and get another cup of coffee. And then we'll come back at 1020 and uh, we'll continue on with the rest of the menu. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next topic. And that is reports. And I'm just kind of freezing the report menu here so you can kind of see what we have out there. You do not have template reports for inventory. They're all canned reports. And, and what we did is we made the gap reports um, their own area here. Um, so it's just easier to see which ones are gap related. And so again, we don't have the numbers from classic. So we'll have to get familiar with um, the actual name of the report. Uh, no 101, 102 anymore. Um, and so just to help along with that, um, the fixed asset by source is your 101 report. Fixed asset by function class is your 102. Fixed asset or the change schedule of fixed assets is your 103. And then obviously the depreciation is 104. It took me like five minutes to figure it out. You know, like, okay, got to get used to it here. We train the brain, no numbers. Um, so those are your gap reports. And then you've got all the other reports too that used to have numbers that we take a little bit longer to get used to these because you 
don't run them as much. Um, but uh, we do have a table out there in the documentation as well. And like I said, we'll go through the documentation here um, in a little bit, and just talk about it. But here are all the other non-GAAP reports. So the 203 is your asset listing by grant source, your book value, which was the 305, the brief asset, which they'll probably run all the time, um, if they aren't using their grids to filter, is the 304 in Classic. The least asset, I believe, is the 202. I don't never really ran that one very often. Um, the location worksheet is the 302. And the pending item is the 501, so I think. <laughs> so those are all of the reports, most of the reports that were available in Classic. Um, I might just pull up a Classic window here. And go into EIS here and go into the menus or the reports, I'm sorry, number six. And so we're kind of looking at this and comparing it to what you're seeing over here. Um, the 001 is a code listing report that basically has a listing of all the codes in the core program. Um, and so that is something that we are working on creating uh, because you really don't have a way just to pull them all into one report. So that is something we have on our list of things to do. Um, and I think that will be on, I think that's gonna be on before production just to have that available. So here's the 101 through 104 reports, which are your gap related reports that are found underneath here. And then, like I said, um, lease asset, asset listing by grant source. So we, we took the names, we just didn't bring along the numbers with them. Um, your location, 302. We do not have an inventory master listing, so that is not available. Um, the brief asset listing, the book value. Um, since we aren't pulling maintenance information over, that one's being excluded. Uh, right now, we don't have an insurance values report. That is something that we're waiting to get more feedback um, on people that are using it. Um, so um, that is one we have on our radar, um, but we are kind of waiting for feedback on that to see if we need to add that. Uh, pending file 501 and an audits report. We are planning on doing a much improved audits report in here compared to what was offered in Classic. Um, so that is something that I believe is going to be on post-production. I don't think it's going to be available for production, but it will be after. Um, and then obviously the item list maker is classic. Well, uh, yeah, we're going to forget about that. So, um, so yes, yeah, so these are the reports that we have out here right now. Um, I have a question. Will there be crosswalks for reports in the documentation like QSAS and payroll? And I'm and that's perfect timing, Mary, because I was just going to show you guys that. Um, so if I go into the inventory manual here, let me show you that. Um, right here is our inventory user manual. And um, so underneath reports, if I click on that, I have the listing of the gap reports and the non-gap with the classic comparison. So you guys will be able to see right away um, that that stuff's available. If you want this to be a printable um, cross crosswalk, I can get that on here. I just haven't done that. Um, so if that's something you guys want, I can click on that and create a little thing that they can print out or they can print out the screen. So, um, but what I've done with this is I have um, gone in and I've kind of made a chapter of the gap reports and then a chapter of the non-gap reports. So when I click on the gap reports, it's going to explain each different one. And I can click on that section to get to that report. 
And if I kind of scroll down, again, it does include the classic counterpart, counterpart for that. And then what we did is just put in some info bulleted, thought it was easier to read that way, um, as well as a screenshot of the um, menu when you click on that and an example of what the report looks like. Um, I just took you know, a little snippet of the report just so they can get an idea. Um, and then the report options. And if there's anything more regarding um, that report, we have a more information. So we kind of put that stuff out there that they can go to those particular areas to get that information. So if I wanna go down to schedule of change in fixed assets, which is the 103, um, again, I created screenshots of like, if you do the summary option, because if you remember the 103 creates two reports, a summary and a detail. It also used to create an error report in Classic that we don't have to worry about in the redesign. So, um, but if, you know, when you are test, doing test imports and stuff, and you do have districts that have a 103 error report, it needs to be cleaned up before you migrate. Talk about that a little bit when we get to the pre-import steps. So, um, so I've got an option of generating the summary schedule, which looks very similar to the EIS 103S. And then if you select the deep, uncheck the summary, it'll generate a detail report, which makes up the, um, it lists the tags that make up these amounts on each of these columns. Um, so those will be provided. Um, and so that's, where that's at with all of that. Um, again, it provides all the report options. I'm going to change those field definitions to report options. I don't like field definitions. <laughs> I just can't have me think about that. Um, so obviously, this is also a work in progress. So um, I'll be making changes here. Um, so I put all the, you know, the gap related reports underneath one chapter with the table of contents up at the top. And then the non gap reports. We have these in here as well. And so because there are you know, quite a few more, and this is still in development, I haven't caught up on this yet, but what I've done is I've created a screenshot of what it looks like and then explaining. And here I did put report options instead of field definitions. So, um, so it kind of lists you know, for the user what these will do. Now, eventually, you know, if with your feedback, if there are certain things where you're like, we need a tool tip for this one, then those are things you need to let us know. And we'll create tool tips for some of these that may be a little confusing. Pretty, you know, most of them are pretty straightforward, but I can see, you know, maybe a couple where it might be a good idea to have a tool tip. So all of the different non-GAP reports are listed here again with all their information. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm at right now with the reports. So if you guys have, you know, input about that, or you're like, I don't like the way it looks, Michelle, let's do something different, let me know. But uh, that's what I have right now. So, but definitely underneath that reports, it does have the crosswalk here. So that'll help them out. Okay, so. Let's go in and try some of these out here. We go into um, gap report. Let's pick on the change schedule. That one's the 103. That's the one that, you know, pretty popular one that's run. Um, and just kind of show you what's available here. So obviously you're going to be running it based on the report type, just like you did in classic by fund, by function, by asset class. So I'm going to pick on asset class. And then you can include and exclude entity IDs just like you could in classic. So if there are like are lots of entity IDs that I want to uh, exclude, I could put those in here. And then those items that have that entity ID that I put in here will not get included on the report, just like it did it in classic. Here's where by default, it's going to create a 103 detail report, sorry. It's going to create a schedule of change to fixed assets by a detail report. And it's going to um, include all of the items that make up those amounts in each of those. If I want a summary, I have to check mark. And if I don't put in a fiscal year, it's going to use the current year. 
So, and if I do want to put one in, I can do that too. So, um, so the way that this works um, is that if I'm in 20, if I'm in 21 and I want to get 2020's report, I should be able to do that by putting in that prior year and it will bring up the information. So go ahead and generate this so you can see what it looks like. And so we tried to make it look um, similar to what they were seeing in um, Classic. So in here, I said by asset class, and it tells me that up at the top. And then by my different types, like it did in Classic, fiduciary, governmental, proprietary, and then all of my different asset classes, my beginning value, what's been added this year that's been capitalized, what's been disposed of, transfer transactions that were done in and out, um, and any adjustments. That's where that error uh, checkbox that we have, it's capitalized asset, it will appear on this column instead of um, an acquisition or a disposition or a transfer. And then your ending balance. So beginning plus acquisitions, minus dispositions, plus transfers in, minus transfers out, plus or minus the adjustment equals my ending balance. So calculation works the same that it did in Classic. And obviously if I wanted a detail report, like I said, I just click off of that and generate again. I know Classic created them both at the same time, but it's not so hard to create two here. And so um, in here, you're going to see, I'm gonna go scroll down to fixtures, furniture, and equipment here. So, oops, I don't wanna hide the columns. So these are all the amounts or capitalized assets because my threshold's over 3,000. Um, these are all the capitalized assets that I have acquired through the year. So you'll see all the tag numbers tied to it. Um, and then I've got my um, amounts here as to beginning and ending balances. So I do have adjustments as well. So I've got acquisition amounts, adjustments. So it factors in my beginning balance, plus, minus, you know, these columns to give me my ending balance. So these figures here should match the beginning and the balances on my summary report. And then each of these totals here would match the totals on my summary report. So very similar to what was in Classic. Um, just to show you one of the non-GAAP reports, let's pick on oh, Brief Asset. That's a pretty popular one. So here is the Brief Asset listing. So again, I can include and exclude entities. I can select specific tag numbers. Um, these are the same prompts that are included in the 304 and Classic. Um, including or excluding specific quantities. Do I want just capitalized assets? I can click on that. Um, my item statuses, obviously those are all gonna migrate over. Um, so we're not you know, sure what districts are using what. So we wanna make sure that we included them all and um, select by an original cost, select by um, or, or sort by whatever by default all of these non-GAAP reports um, sort by tag number, except for the location report. That's gonna be obviously by location. But if you wanna add another um, level of sort in here, you can go ahead and select this. And then you've got selection options. So in the 304, there is an area there where you can go in and just include specific asset classes. You wanna filter down that report. Um, so you can go in and enter those particular uh, filters. Um, and then you just go ahead and generate the report. And I'm gonna just go for it and do it all here and not put anything in, see how long this takes. So this should be including all of my items. And I probably have I don't know, close to 10,000 items on this report. 
449 pages that took what five seconds 10 seconds max to generate that so and when you look at this um, there are some things that um, I think a little more cleanup maybe we were talking about this I mentioned it just yesterday so I don't even know if anyone's seen this yet but um, I noticed that the location may need to um, be enlarged a little bit more and maybe make the organization code a little bit smaller because I noticed some of them are wrapping um, so, but other than that, it's very clean and we're trying to keep like the description as long as we can, because some of those descriptions are pretty lengthy and we want to get as you know, much information as we can, it will wrap. So, um, if, you know, there'll be an, an extra line of description if there's more. Um, one thing to keep in mind too, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, but the descriptions in classic, you had description one and description two, those will be combined into one description in redesign. So those will be um, pulled in together. So, so yeah, it's pretty readable. I liked the brief asset in classic and I think this looks um, great as well. And like I said, if they don't want the brief asset or something, they can go in and filter um, the grid and get an extract of that. So, but um, this will give them the reports in PDF format. Okay, any questions about the reports? The rest, I'll just have you guys just play around with them and take a look at them, but. Um, you know, all like I said, like I showed you the documentation, they're all out there, most of it. Um, explaining each of them. I'll go ahead and just get rid of these. Okay, we'll go ahead and we'll move on to system. And um, I'm not gonna cover everything in here because it's, some of this still is a work in progress with the imports. Um, so I'm still trying to figure all of that out and making sure that we've got all that data in there. Um, but the capability of the import is being able to go in and load like spreadsheets. So if they've got a bunch of computers that they want to import in as items, they'll be able to do that. Um, so that type of stuff will be available. It's also going to work, I'll click on it here. It's also going to work as a mass change. So if I needed to go in and update an item category and several items, I can create a spreadsheet of that with the new item category and update records. There's my category codes. So what it'll do then on that spreadsheet, pull those category codes for those tags and it will replace them with whatever's on the spreadsheet. So you do have like, you used to have an EIS change option in Classic. This is kind of the replacement for that um, to do these mass changes. Um, going in and adding acquisitions, changing locations, uh, stuff like that. So um, I, to be honest with you, I haven't done a lot of um, playing around with this. I'm not very uh, comfortable with all of it yet, but uh, we will be adding documentation um, and updating that uh, once uh, we get a little more familiar with it and we'll get that stuff um, documented for you guys. But this really, some of this is the equivalent of the EIS IX EIS import. So, um, so that information, you know, is basically this import does, you know, some of the same features that the EIS IMP program did. Uh, capitalization criteria is your EIS cap. It allows you to go in and change your capitalization amount and life limit. So it does do a projection. And it's going to treat things the same way that it did in classic as well. So those items that were once capitalized will no longer be, if, you know, you've um, increased the threshold. Um, and so that will be also reflected in the gap schedules too for those items that are capitalized. So obviously, so those will get changed and those beginning balances will be set retroactive um, to the beginning of the year with the new values. So it does do the same type of updating that it did in classic. Uh, change password allows you to go in and uh, change the password. We are um, improving this 
Um, so we do have a JIRA issue out, out there for this. Um, you know, we don't know, um, you, you know, right now, you can't change the password uh, just for yourself here, but if you, if you need to change the password for somebody else, uh, we wanted to improve that. We wanted to model it more like how the change password works in SASR and, and payroll. So, um, so this will get updated a little bit. And that will be for production as well. And then our users. So these are the users that I have here right now. And so users are not going to get pulled over into um, EIS um, from EIS. So if you've got you know, two or three people at the district that process inventory, you have to add the user accounts and redesign once you import everything over. So those will have to be created in here. And I'll just click on create. And you can see what all is available here. So you'll be creating a username and their actual name, a title if needed, email address, roles. And these are documented. Um, but the roles are going to be there. They're just, um, we don't have any custom roles. So it's just these uh, particular roles, read only, standard, group manager, and admin. So similar to what you're seeing in payroll and UCS. <clears throat> um, account expiration information, it'll be enabled by default. So the same type of information that you're used to seeing like in the user accounts in redesign. So. Once that account is created, I'm going to close out of here. <clears throat> I'm going to go pick on Sally. So here's Sally's account. And she needs a role. I'm going to do standard access. And so what happens then is uh, then you're able to go in and add a user, or I'm, I'm sorry, uh, create a password for that user. So by going in, and obviously there isn't an old password, and this is another thing that we're going to be updating. Um, so you'll just be entering in their new password, verify it, and change password to set a password for them. So they'll be able to log in. We have a couple questions, and I don't think I can answer these, but maybe uh, Joy and Jason can help me out here. Um, will external authentication be an option? We had two people ask that. I believe that's something we're discussing currently. Um, we, we may be adding that uh, post-production. Thank you. Okay, any questions about users? And so and that's what we have out here right now underneath the system menu. Now I know that someone's asking about, what about the import log? What about the app log, stuff like that. So that is stuff that we have discussed as well. And so um, those are things that you know, we want to add as well. And I think I might have that on that agenda. Um, I don't think I have like when it will be added, but um, I know that we're aware of that. And we get that you want to see um, you know, the import logs and things like that. So um, that type of stuff will be, uh, um, we're planning on making available here in inventory as well. Right now, um, okay, we got another question. Currently in USAS and payroll, if you set a local password, you can't change them to external authentication. Can you switch them after the fact of EIS? And Jody said that they're working, uh, we'll take that into consideration when we're working on making this available. Okay.
So now that, that we kind of went through the whole, um, the menu, I want to get into the migration parts of this. Um, so hopefully this kind of helped familiarize you guys uh, with, you know, how it's going to look. And um, one thing that I guess I should ask Jason and Jody is if we're going to have some type of test um, instance out there or like we do with payroll and USAS, that's a public instance that people can use. Um, just kind of happen to think about that. Yeah, I think um, to be consistent with um, the way we do things for USAS and payroll, we can probably do that. Um, okay. Not sure if that will be linked to an actual USAS test instance or not, but um, yeah, we can certainly look into making that available. Okay, thank you. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to shift over to um, the documentation and just talk about um, you know, what's available out there and then get into the migration steps. So obviously our documentation is a work in progress. You know, we're going to be adding things onto it, but this is what we have out here right now. We have our inventory user manual. Um, you can disregard this getting started. That's something I'm seeing that you guys probably won't see. Um, so you can just ignore that. But in our inventory user manual, you know, we have um, the different links either here, if you've got this available off to the side here, um, in the wiki or underneath here, you can click on those particular options and get more information. Um, we do have a help menu. Um, and when you click on that, there is an about page um, that will talk about what version is currently on there, as well as browser requirements. And there's also a documentation the user manual is underneath help as well. That'll take you right here to our user manual. And so if I go in here and just kind of look at, you know, these different areas, we already looked at reports, but underneath core, we do have tables comparing it back to classic. And so obviously you can go into those specific chapters to get more information about it. Um, and then we did the same thing with transactions. And listing those as well as links to take you. And anything that we have noted here is important things to, to look at. And this is talking about how the pending file will not be imported in and neither will the maintenance information from item screen. And then we have our reports, which we just went through. And then our system manual, which um, obviously we go into each one of these and then look here, but it does have the classic counterpart in here as well. And then um, our appendix, which there's not much out here right now. Um, just the migration procedures, which is the most important at this point. Um, so when I click on that, I have free data, post import, and I have the common import errors. Now we are finalizing our technical migration step. So that's a work in progress right now. And it does use, um, this inventory model does use a slightly different one for container creation <clears throat> and configuration and deployment. So um, when we announced this, the inventory was out here, the beta, we also had a form there asking those that are interested in participating in beta to fill out the form. And so we've got five districts right now. And I think we might be just holding with those right now because that's a lot um, for us to get started. And they're all wanting to start next week. Um, and so um, with that, what we're going to do because the technical migration um, is going to be different from what you guys experience with USAS and payroll, we're going to help walk you through that. So these beta districts we're going to be going through and helping walk them through it. That'll better prepare us to document it for production and get them more familiar with it as well, um, the ITC. So one of the things on the beta form that you filled out was your technical contact at the ITC so that you know, we can reach out to them and go through the technical migration uh, steps with them. Um, Jody, I don't know if you want to, you have anything further to uh, discuss with that. 
I don't think so. I mean, I think you mentioned that it's still a work in progress and uh, I'm actually going to be sending out those emails to touch base with those ITCs. I need to create a Google form because we're going to set up some time slots and, and start working one on one with with helping those ITCs uh, get going on that. So by the time beta is done, we'll have a, a procedure in place, you know, and documented so that um, you know, your tech person can, you know, get those um, instances and stuff set up for inventory since obviously it's its own application. Any questions about that? Will there be another training like this after the production release? You know, Andrew, I was thinking about that. Um, you know, I think we're going to kind of do a wait and see and see what the migration steps for the technical um, involves and we'll go from there and see if it's something that's pretty well documented or if we need to go through some type of um, training for that. Um, but, and one other thing too, I wanted to let you all know is we are working on like a training modules uh, with the management council and almost like a user and end user training that will allow them to go through, you know, this is how you create a, an item, an inventory, and it will take them through the steps, um, probably in a much better format than what I was showing you guys. Um, so we are working on these training modules with the management council as well, and having that out there. So, you know, you can go to, you know, your end user, um, here you go. This is what you need to do to create an item. Here you go. This is what you do to create a disposition and stuff like that. And you can just give them those tools and they can go in and learn it. It's kind of self-learning almost. Um, so um, I don't know when that's going to be available. Um, and I, you know, pretty get much guaranteed that it's not going to be available by production, but that is something that we are definitely working on with them. So um, hopefully we'll have that out there. So I'm glad you got some good responses here. Wonderful, I think it will be too. Um, just seeing what they've done with other departments, it looks pretty cool. So, um, so hopefully we can get that done soon. But until then, um, this is more for the ITC more than anyone, <clears throat> but it's very important to keep the communication open with your districts when it comes to these pre and post import steps. So on to the steps. So create data extract. Now don't start, you know, freaking out when you see this, <laughs> thinking that there's a lot of information on here. There is, but at the same time, um, there's stuff that's very optional that doesn't have to happen. Um, and so we do, as we always have said, we strongly recommend the doing test imports for inventory. You know, looking at that import log that's created and making sure that everything imported over. So that's kind of paying attention to <clears throat> the pre-data and the post-import when you're thinking about that. Because you go in and do a test import, you're going to go start running those balancing reports ASAP to see after you look at the import log to say, okay, import log looks good. Nothing like crazy out there. So I'm gonna start running balancing reports and balance it back to classic to see. So there could be things in there that don't balance that may need to be fixed in classic, which is where you go to the pre-data extract to find out what it is. And so what we've done, and so that's what this whole blurb is here at the beginning. Um, but so we have, we have some, I've got a question here. We have some districts that may start using this. Will there be a future, will there be in the future a model of inventory structure, where to begin and what links to what type of thing? Um, as in like the whole like migration, um, Heidi, is that what you're talking about? Like where, where do we start as an ITC to get them rolling? Kind of like an overview of like a decision tree almost type of thing, like a like a, a, a data module, like here's where you begin, this links to this, this links to this, like what a, you know, like an overview, we've all been in it and we understand what a class is, what, and what those types of things, like setting kind of like where to begin type of stuff for those that have never used classics inventory system and have always hired it out and maybe are interested in using this 
once it becomes available. And I know that's a future thing. It may be a wish list type of thing, but just letting you know, we have had some districts that have at least spoken to me saying, you know, I may be interested in moving over to that after I see it. So just kind of keeping that in mind for the future. Yes. So yeah, so yeah, you may have districts that never used EIS that think, you mm, know, I'm going to be using it since it's, you know, on the web here now. So yes, um, that is something too. We're going to have that type of area where brand new people that haven't migrated over, this is what you need to do. And this is what you can look at, you know, to get a feel for it. So that I believe is kind of what we're trying to do with the management council is have those type of um, mod training modules for those people so they can get familiar with it. Okay, so the special notes regarding inventory migration, we put this out here for a reason, just to make sure that you guys are aware of some of the things that you know, need to be known before they migrate over. And so obviously the USSR migration must happen before, which most of these districts have already been on USAS, or at the same time that the inventory data is migrated. So if you don't have districts out, you know, using payroll USAS yet, you can migrate all three. Um, and those are the things obviously that we're still working on to uh, get that all finalized. But um, for those that are already, you can't go in and run inventory, redesign inventory, and still be in classic USAS. That can't happen because of the pending file. So, um, so my USAS migration has to happen um, before or at the same time you do inventory. The maintenance information uh, will not be migrated over. So that maintenance section and item screen is not being included. Um, existing classic, classic pending file will not be migrated over. So we talked about that already and how they're going to be able to pull. Um, or um, I think maybe um, there'll be capability to import that information in for those that um, aren't in, um, in, in using USASR at the, at the beginning. Um, um, so that's something we probably will be adding more documentation to that. I think right now we're more focused on the migrating districts that already have migrated in USAS um, and now are wanting to migrate to inventory. And then the last note, existing EIS users. So those will not be imported over, so you'll need to create new user accounts. So those are the four things we kind of wanted to make note of, so you're aware of that before you start a test import. <clears throat> and then down here, are some of um, things that you would want to look at and make sure are addressed um, pre-data extract. So this first one here is ensuring that their gap flag is set, that they are on gap, that you know, they're not in the middle of an inventory, a new appraisal, a new inventory, and they're gonna plan on doing a, a brand new inventory in the middle of this, that's not going to work well. Um, so you have to make sure that, you know, you talk to the district about where they're at right now. And if they're all have their EIS gap flag set to yes, then everything's going to get mi migrated over the same way. <clears throat> I did have a ticket um, asking about um, a district that wants to do new inventory. And, and should they sit tight and wait, <coughs> excuse me, uh, because they have their spreadsheet and they're ready. Um, should they sit tight and wait um, until inventory or should they do that now? And so um, there are a couple of things with a new inventory that um, we still need to discuss like the EIS gap um, program and stuff like that. And so I told them if they're in the middle and they're, you know, have a new inventory, please do it in classic and get them uh, the new inventory done there. Uh, that way, their beginning balancers are set, they're all ready to go so that you can easily migrate over without being worried about that. So if you do have districts that are in the middle or going to be doing a new inventory soon, um, do that in classic, get that all squared away using those loading a new inventory steps um, before they migrate over to redesign. Um, okay, so um, so yes, ensuring that you know gap flag looks good. And like I said, if the gap flag 
is not set or is not correct and you're just not sure where this district is at in inventory, that could happen. Um, then you need to create a ticket to SSDT and we'll help you out with that. Um, running the 501 report, which is the pending file report in classic, and we recommend you do that um, too, and just look and see what's out there. They could have a bunch of things that they never plan on tagging. Um, and like we said, the um, pending file will not migrate over. So if it is up to date, which I'm sure most everyone's is, um, then generate a report and save it. That way then, when you go in to pull that information over using the pull from USAS option and pending, then you can compare what uh, redesign has compared to classic and make any cleanup that you need to do. Running a 304 report um, of all active status tags that are capitalized. And the reason why I'm saying this is because of the gap reports. Um, the gap reports are looking at active capitalized assets. And what you want to do is run through the missing fund function and asset class codes. Now, that's something that we've always recommended in our EIS fiscal year closing for people to do is just take a look and make sure that they don't have any missing fund function or asset class codes on their active capitalized assets. So the easiest way to find those is what I have highlighted in green here, running it three different ways. Run it by sorting it by fund and those items that do not have a fund will appear at the top of the report, will be easy to spot. Same thing, run it again by function and then by asset class. All empty ones will appear at the top of the report. Those missing, those particular um, codes, they can create transfer transactions. That could possibly clean up a lot of the optional steps down here. Because if they do have missing function codes or missing fund codes, um, those amounts will appear on the gap reports as unknown fund types. There's always a section, and I know you guys know, you've seen those unknown fund type sections in those gap reports where it has an amount, but we don't know where that's coming from. Well, this step may fix that, step three. And if not, that's what step four is doing. So the next step after running that brief asset report is to run gap reports. And so there are steps in these gap reports that are optional, optional. So you are not required unless we have more testing where we find something that we may have to change these. Um, they are not required to correct these figures that are marked as optional but we have provided the steps on how to identify those amounts and how to correct them. We've had this documentation out here for years about how to correct these. So, but it seems like we're migrating to new software. We need to kind of pay attention to these. Now, what I'm talking about are these unknown fund type sections that you see on the gap reports acquisitions prior to system startup amounts that you see on these reports or reports some of these gap reports that say invalid function invalid class or undefined now they show up in classic and they're going to show up in redesign so if you've got a million dollar amount on the acquisitions prior to system startup um, on the 101 report, it, that million dollar figure is going to show up on the redesigns equivalent report too. That's why I'm saying it's optional. So, you know, districts have let this amount be in their data for this long. We don't expect you to clean them up, but we left it optional in case you want to. I hope that makes sense. So 
what I've done is I've broken this down by each report, stating what's supposed to be fixed and what can optionally be fixed. So on the 101 report here, um, it's going to generate an EIS 101. So this is all classic stuff we're talking about. It may also generate an EIS air report. You notice there's no optional next to this. They have to clean this up. So this um, does talk about this. And I even have, I did YouTube videos for this years ago and the steps have not changed any. Um, so uh, we've provided a link for the video to look through this stuff and also how, you know, so you can look at the video or you can look at the steps and how to correct any tags that appear on the EIS error. Now, obviously districts are running their gap reports at the end of every fiscal year. So these should be caught, you know, at the end of the year um, anyway. So I don't know how many will have air reports, but we just wanted to put this out here. If they do, let's clean it up and get it before you, you migrate their stuff over. Um, the other thing, and these are the optional steps of the 101, it may include a section called assets with unknown fund type section. So these appear on this report. And like I said, they will come over with the same amount in redesign on the same report. Um, but the reason why there are amounts underneath assets with unknown fund type is because of this or this. Either the tag doesn't contain a fund field and item screen, which that 304 report should let us know about. Um, or, go back to where it was, the fund code for a tag does not have a defined fund type in the maintenance screen. So again, we've got a video that we had out there for a long time that explains all of this, or you can follow the steps if you want to clean it up. Same thing with acquisitions prior to system startup. So if they do have an amount underneath, and I think the acquisitions prior to system startup is underneath each fund type section of the report, it may be zero, that's awesome. It may be a million dollars. So again, those will roll over into the new reports and redesign. So when you're running a 101 and comparing it to a, the 101 equivalent in the redesign, all of these amounts, assets with unknown fund type, acquisitions are all gonna be there in both reports. But if you wanna clean them up, the, these are the steps to do so. And so it just, um, how to, why you get the acquisitions prior system startup, because the tag doesn't have an associated acquisition transaction record. Makes sense, acquisitions prior to system startup. Or the fund dimension, fund dimension of the UCIS account code in that acquisition transaction record is missing. It's not crazy how these little things can put these on these certain areas of the report. So again, how to locate if it's item, item one that you're dealing with or how to locate if it's item two here that you're dealing with. Oops. And videos to explain. And so, out of the 101, the air report is the one that needs to be done. Anything else with these type of messages on the report are optional. The 102 report, all optional. I would run one just to make sure that you, you're able to run them. And the 102 has three different options and it's got an A for all schedules. That's the one that we recommend they run. It'll create both a summary and a detail to make sure that everything looks good. You know, review the report. But again, if you see any invalid function or invalid class messages with amounts or unclassified amounts, those will get carried over to redesign, but you can optionally clean them up beforehand if you want to by going in and doing it here. The 103 report, um, 
There is an air report that could be generated. That's something that should always be cleaned up at every fiscal year end. If they're running the 103 and they see an air report, they should be cleaning up before they close. Um, but if you do discover that there is an air report, those need to be cleaned up. And so um, there are three different types of air messages they'll get on the 103. So these three here, and we do have videos that we've had out there for a while in YouTube, and I've got the links to the videos explaining how those get fixed, or you can follow the notes in here. I think the videos are a little more descriptive of the steps, so it might be a good idea to see those. So that 103E report should not be ignored. That should be cleaned up. Otherwise, on the summary report, if you see something with an unknown fund type, that's an optional step, just like they were in the other reports. If you don't clean them up, they will show as unknown fund types with the same amount in the redesign reports. And like I said, if some of this gets cleaned up in step three, when you're finding missing fund function and asset class, a lot of that will clean up what's already appearing in here. So you may not even have to worry about some of this stuff if you wanted to clean it up because it may have already been taken care of when you did step three. And then the 104, again, optional. Um, there may be an unknown fund type section in there. If you don't clean it up, it will carry over to the redesign. So it's just good to just kind of sit here and just kind of look at these and decide, you know, you're going through your first test import with the district. Okay, let's get a game plan as to what we're gonna do here. Are we gonna let these ride and move over to redesign? And if your next question is, can we fix them in redesign? I'm still looking at that to determine that you can. You should be able to. So, but I need to test that more to confirm that you can. You can clean it up in classic. You should be able to clean them up and redesign at a later time. So I will confirm that with you guys later. But I wanted to give you guys as much information as I could so that it helps, you know, when you are going through the post import balancing, say, why are these off? Ah. I wonder, you know, if it's something with this air report or the 103 air, um, or is there something else that we've discovered, you know? So, um, you know, just wanted to give you as much information as we could as to what you could be doing in classic. Now, this may be something you guys are already, your districts are already spot on with this stuff and we don't have to worry about it. But then I know there may be districts that haven't done their inventory in a year especially with um, not requiring the capital assets for period H anymore. Just don't know how much districts have caught up on their inventory. So, um, so there, they may be discovering things that you didn't know were in their reports. So, um, I have another question here. If a district is running behind on closing EIS and classic, would they catch up on the redesign or do those previous years need to be closed in classic prior to migration? Is there a closing checklist in the redesign? So I, re I recommend they catch up. I really do um, just to get things going in class, you know, and get their classic stuff caught up because it's all there. They can, you know, iron that stuff out. Um, it just depends on like how many items you're talking about and how long they've been on the redesign too, because I don't know how big their pending file is, you know? So, um, you know, you're gonna have to look and see how big the pending file is. And if it's crazy large and they've only been on redesign USAS for six months, you know, there's probably gonna be a lot of items that they're gonna have to you know, manually enter in because they may not be marked for inventory um, in USAS R. So um, I would recommend that they, they get caught up before um, they migrate over. 
is there a closing checklist? It's a very good question. We haven't created one yet, um, but we are gonna have a closing checklist too um, in here. So hoping to get that done by production. In fact, I'm gonna make a note of that right now. <laughs> Okay, going on to the post import steps here, which is much prettier than the pre data extract steps. Um, again, doing a test import strongly, almost requirement really, you, you should always be doing the test imports. Um, the data cleanup um, right now, you know, that import log is going to be created during the technical migration part of it that, you know, we're still working on right now. Um, but, you know, I don't know if I've got one. Look and see. I'm going to have a generic one here. Um, and this is kind of what the import log looks like. Um, and so it's going to show you like what imported over, the configuration information, um, the category codes. So there was one record imported for configuration information, the that screen stuff. Your item uh, category codes, there were four of them. So if I went into item screen, or I'm sorry, into cat screen to look at those, and there's four records, those are the four records that were brought over. Um, condition codes, disposition codes. You know, we have five disposition methods, all five of those records were carried over. Function codes, so these are all the EIS mate information here. So some location codes that did not get, um, let's see that did not get pulled over. Um, and so what this means is that there's an invalid category or number. So no blank values are allowed. So what that means is, and I don't know how it got on there other than an import, is when I look at the location code in a location screen, it's got either the location category or the location number. Both of those are not filled in. So, um, so that's why it's saying it's um, giving you an error on that, and it will not include those location codes on the import. Now, those items that contain those location codes, um, those will still import over, but I'm guaranteeing that those items will probably just be partial codes or no code at all on the uh, location field. So this is something that you know needs to be looked at to see what can we do um, to clean this up in classic so that things get imported. And in this type of situation, it may be um, where a lot of these codes don't have related transactions, related items to them. So they can be deleted in location screen. However, if there are, you'd wanna run a 304 report or these low, you know, and sort it by location codes and see which ones may have items. And then those need to be probably cleaned up because you probably don't want those to come over with blank locations. We've included, you know, we're while we're doing all of these test imports and um, our focus group districts have been wonderful about allowing us to use their data to do the test imports. We're coming across some of these situations these are all defined so far, what we have, and this common import errors and warnings. So I've been documenting these and telling you how to change how, what the um, error means, you know, what the error is, what does it mean, and how to fix it, whether you fix it in classic or redesign. So, um, so we're trying as we're you know, importing these and discovering any other ones, we're gonna put them out here. So again, um, we'll go back to this. 
And after my location messages, I it um, more more of the uh, maintenance screen information, organization codes. There weren't any. They don't use them, so that's why it's a zero. Um, and then I've got my transaction data at the end of this import log. We've got the items, 10,136 records, acquisitions. There's probably going to be more acquisitions because you have some items that have multiple acquisitions against them. Our disposition uh, transactions, 639 records, transfer transaction zero. So when I see a zero, the first thing I do is go out there in Classic and pull up the transfer transaction underneath um, EIS screen and make sure that that's correct. They don't have any transfer transactions. Um, and if they don't, then I know, obviously, nothing got migrated over. So I hope that helps is to see, you know, kind of how this import log works. It's pretty simple. And, uh, you know, just to kind of read through it. Um, but one thing, um, I, I think that we are going to add before production is when it comes to especially the transactions, if we do encounter like items that didn't get imported in, it was showing the record number. So you could go look up that record number on the extract file, but instead we wanted to add the tag number to the import log so that you can see exactly where that's coming from. So that is something that we're going to add before production and include the tag number on the record. We really can't do that with the maintenance codes, but we can do that with the transaction ones. Okay. So, so that's the first thing. Look at the import log, very important. Make sure, you know, things look kind of weird, crazy. It's not on the import errors already. And if you need some help, create a ticket. And we'll walk through that with you. And it's, you know, we need to know too. So if that's something that we need to document on the import errors, we want to make sure we can do that. Um, the application setup post import, some things that you just want to check, like the configuration, check that back to classics, that screen and make sure that everything matches. Same thing with the fiscal year. So if I'm in fiscal year 21 in inventory in EIS, I want to make sure that my fiscal years there should only be one uh, on one row on that grid or fiscal year 21. That's the current year. And the configuration or the capitalization information should be on there as well. Um, creating the pending file and adding the users. So those are some of the application setup. Obviously, if you're doing a test import, you kind of skip over those. You know, you, options for this, these first two, you want to make sure that those are okay. But going in and creating a pen file, pending file on user, you don't need to do yet because you're just doing a test import. So if you want to make sure that uh, you go through the balancing. And so here are the balancing um, steps that we have. So your classic report versus your redesign report and how to run them um, and make sure that they balance. Um, so you'll be kind of going through those um, and really, you know, I just did another district yesterday and it didn't take long at all to get through these. I mean, that's basically you go to import, you're making sure that your fiscal years match, you know, you do this test import, you're making sure your fiscal years match, things look good there. So I'm going to go right to my balancing and take a look and see does everything match back to cl classic. Um, and so these are the reports. Some of these are optional. It's just based on if they are tracking leased information and stuff like that. Um, the location worksheet would be kind of hard to match because there are no amounts to balance. It's just a lot of data. Um, that one I'm still trying to figure out if maybe we can do instead to, com to see that everything moved over. I think and sort it by location is maybe to run a 304 report um, instead and sort that by location and compare the two um, and see that everything matches. But um, I don't know, that one's a little hard because there's just so much information on that one. And that's why I also put it as optional too. 
um, the brief asset listing, you're running it for everything. So if there's one report that's going to balance to show that everything imported over, it's the brief asset. Um, got a question here. Will there be a file import and file archive tab like in USASR? Yes. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit on some of these other things I put out there on the agenda of upcoming stuff. But yes, we are planning on doing like an EIS CD equivalent. We're going to have that out here too. Um, so, so yes, so like, like I said, the brief asset listing, if you run it for everything under the sun and run it for the 304 and classic and the totals match, everything came over. Um, but you still need to run like these gap reports and stuff and make sure that things are tracking correctly and balancing back. Those are very important. Those are the things that the auditors are looking at too. So you want to make sure that's good to go. Okay. Any other questions about that? That's what we have out there now in our appendix is just the migration steps. We are planning on adding more FAQs, stuff like that. We're just, we haven't, haven't had the time to do that yet. So that stuff will be out there too. We'll just keep building onto the inventory. Um, the inventory issues, um, this is the JIRA issues for inventory. And um, I'm in the inventory project. And in here, um, the way I have my dashboard set up, I can go in and create a filter of just inventory issues or outstanding issues. And I don't know how many of you guys are using the dashboards in JIRA. Um, if you are, you know, you can create a new one. Um, or, you know, if you're using them for payroll and USAS to track things, you can also create one for the inventory project as well. So in this example here, what I've done is I've just gone into the inventory project by list mode um, and, it, you know, displays it like this, and you'll see everything that we've done from the beginning. Um, and I've got, you know, my um, columns on here are, you know, the versions we have version 1.0 is the production version. And since, you know, beta, we're still in testing. Um, and then we have 1.1 for post-production. Um, if I wanted to go in here, I go back to my, let's go back to my dashboard here. I have a lot of filters. So you can track a lot of different things. But I have a filter for all inventory JIRA issues, for all of them, whatever been completed and what's still outstanding. So if I want to go in and take this existing one and make a new filter off of this of just outstanding, I could go in and make sure that my status is in progress and to do because I don't want to see the done ones because that's already happened. Um, and then, um, I don't know, I think that's about all, all of what I already have on here looks good. So I could then go in and save this and do a save as, because I don't want to overwrite, this is all inventory. I just want outstanding inventory issues. And I could do a save as, I've been wanting to do this, I just haven't done it yet. I thought I'd do it and show you guys. And click on save. And now I have just outstanding status. If I go back to my dashboard, now I will have an outstanding inventory section. And if I you know, want to go out there every once in a while and take a look and see where things are at, I can go click on that and get that information. One way of tracking, you know, what's sitting out there. You can do that with USAS and payroll as well. Okay. And so I'm going to look at the agenda here because I think we're pretty much wrapping things up. 
Um, we do have a new component on the service desk. Um, so when you go to create a ticket, you'll see, you know, USAS, um, USPS, you'll see EMIS, and now you'll see inventory. So the classic service desk still is for classic EIS tickets. So that's still got EIS for the classic service desk, but the redesigned one, you now have an inventory component. So you can create um, tickets underneath the inventory. And we did talk about documentation already. So what's ahead? Well, for me, testing, testing, and more testing. <laughs> uh, but for you guys, um, what you're seeing here is, you know, my instance doesn't have the latest and greatest that our amazing developers have been doing. Um, so there are a couple things in here that you may be questioning what some of you have already in chat um, to see, you know, do we have this or will I have that? So I just wanted to talk about, make note of some of the, some of them that are sitting out there as to do's or outstanding um, in our JIRA system. Um, the application timeout, um, we are going to make a 30 minute timeout so that it automatically times out if it hasn't been active for 30 minutes. Um, I have, as I mentioned before, the filter row enhancements like greater than, less than, we want to have that out there. And I put the JIRA issue number behind each one of these in case you guys do want to look that stuff up as well. Um, we already talked about adding the current year as a constant display so they know what year they're in. Um, just like we have with USAS, you know, the, the period, which would be um, by fiscal year. Um, update the import log to include tag numbers on those transaction related errors. So we are going to have that. We talked about that. Um, also, we didn't have any need for a message area or an application health like we do with, um, especially with USAS. Um, this isn't needed since inventory doesn't really have an activity ledger. Um, so we won't be doing anything like that. Um, and then these other things are just breaking down some of the enhancements that are going to be made in certain areas, like acquisitions. Um, when a vendor is added, um, imported in, it doesn't, it adds the vendor um, number, but not the name. So we need to, that's kind of a, a more of a bug. So we're going to make sure that that's fixed um, so that it imports both the vendor name with the vendor number. Um, with items, um, adding the like to date depreciation field to the more column, I noticed it wasn't in there and I felt like well, it might be, it might be something that we talked about with the focus group, um, not as important. Um, so we've got it out there. I don't know how soon we'll have that out there, but um, to add that like to date depreciation field to uh, the more so you can go out there and have that stuff displayed. Um, Ability to add multiple acquisitions. I was waiting for somebody to ask me that. Um, so when I went in to create an item, you know, and I pulled from the pending file, um, and then it took me right to continue items to create my item, it didn't give me an option to go back and add another item while, you know, another, you know, pending item while I'm in the middle of creating my item. So that is going to be added. So right now, um, they go in and pull that first uh, pending file, um, go in and post the tag. And at this point, they're going to have to go into the acquisition record and add any additional acquisition items to that tag. Um, but we are going to make sure that that's available during item creation and not after the fact. Um, Populate the asset class and items if it's listed in categories that we just noticed that it didn't auto populate the asset class when creating an item. If that asset class is in the category codes, so that'll be fixed. Um, pending, we did talk about this, the ability to re-add rejected items. If you deleted an item by mistake um, on the pending file and you want to bring that back in, we will have the ability to include rejected items based on the date that you enter. Um, reports, including an options page. I was waiting for somebody to ask me about that too. Um, so with all of the reports, we want to include an options page like we have with USAS um, so that you can see all the options that you selected. When you start looking at like the brief asset listing, there's a lot of options. 
So um, be nice to know what you selected. So we're gonna include an options page on everything. And we're gonna include that 001 report equivalent in redesign. Um, we're gonna improve the change password, which we talked about already. And we talked about this already too. District has a new inventory. What should they do? Get it going in Classic. Get things going, make sure that they, you know, they have a new inventory, you know, use those loading a new inventory steps that are available in EIS system manager manual um, and get that going because, you know, we're still looking into like the EIS gap, um, setting the beginning balances and stuff like that. I don't have that information for you guys. So if the district's waiting, get them going in classic. Um, that way everything's all set to go and they can migrate over easily. Uh, Post-production EIS CD, that was one of the questions. Um, having EICD and being able to archive, you know, their EISCD reports. Yes, we are going to have those capabilities and that's the JIRA issue um, tied to that. An audit report, we're gonna have that out here. And like I said before, having some type of monitor equivalent, like looking at the app log and the admin log. Um, so we're gonna have that stuff out there as well. I don't have a JIRA issue number for that one, but um, those are things that are on our radar that are gonna get done. Okay, I told you guys it was going to take longer than an hour. I didn't think it'd take longer than two hours, so I'm so sorry. But, you know, a lot of um, hopefully good and helpful information for you guys just to see what's going on and where we're at uh, with this. And, you know, and like Jody said, too, we are going to get in touch with the beta districts and get them going next week, which will help us to tremendously in order to um, you know, tweak our technical migration steps and uh, anything else that needs to be done before production. Um, if you guys don't have any further questions, um, I so appreciate you guys taking the time on Friday morning to go through this with me. Um, hope it was helpful and uh, you guys have a great weekend. You too, thank you. Thank you.